Namaskar. On behalf of the Raza Foundation, we welcome you this afternoon to yet another lecture in our ongoing series, Raza Centenary Lectures. You have already heard historian Sudhir Chandra, art historian and critic Geeti Sen, art critic Yashodhara Dalmia, and also biographer of Raza, Rubina Karode, well-known art critic, and a conversation between Dinesh Vazirani, Dadiba Pangdol, and Arun Badhera. This afternoon, we welcome Ashwin E. Raj Gopalan, who is the director of the Piramal Art Foundation and also has been leading the Piramal Museum of Art since its inception in November 2015. Uh, he has been in the field of modern and contemporary art for about two decades now and has been focusing on institution building and creating long-term visions for corporations and large collections across the world. In this context of Raza Centenary, he had researched the formative period, the Bombay years, from 1943 to 1950, if you recall, in 1950, Raza left for France. This is a period about which little is known and little is documented. And uh, Ashwin has been working on a book, which hopefully will come out sometime early next year. So here you are. Ashwini Raj Gopalan talking about Raza, the Bombay years, 1943-50. Mr. Raj Gopalan. Thank you, sir. This has been a very, very um, amazing opportunity for me because I think I'm the least qualified person to be on this series. And, um, you know, I, I have... Uh, been researching Raza for a while, uh, partly because of the collection uh, that we've been building at the Piramal Museum, but uh, also because, you know, uh, he's one of the few artists who actually, uh, who, who I have collected, but have never met. I've met him only once, actually, uh, at the India Art Fair for a few minutes, uh, you know, when, when Krishan Khanna was around uh, exhibiting something. And so that's it. My, my encounter uh, with Raza Saab has been literally five minutes at best. So, uh, you know, so the, I've been quite, um, you know, curious to learn about the man. And of course, uh, his career has been very long. Uh, you know, he's had a 75 year plus uh, career as a painter, uh, you know, and, and he, um, so there's so much to look at, there's so much to learn from. And um, very, uh, I mean, just before the, the lockdown started, uh, sometime actually 2019, um, we had done an exhibition at the Piramal Museum uh, called Traversing Terrains, and we did a little bit of a, 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 a retrospective uh, of Raza's works. And it actually started from the 40s and went on till about the 90s. And our predominant uh, thesis for the exhibition was that Raza was a painter of landscapes, irrespective of what uh, medium or what period. And, and you know, because based on uh, predominantly the titles of the work and also the kind of um, uh, you know, uh, visuals that we were seeing. So, so we said, you know, he was a painter of uh, landscapes, not, not a landscape painter, please don't mistake that, but a painter of the land, uh, you know, the places he's been to, uh, and he's very connected and very rooted, which is why I think he kept coming back to his Indian uh, ideas, both through literature, poetry, as well as, uh, you know, his art. So um, I, I, what I'll do is I will share uh, a, a screen. Uh, it's always nice to see paintings rather than my face. And so I'll share a screen with all of you. And um, I'll, I'll walk you through a, a period, a period that has been forgotten um, in, in much of uh, India's modern art history, while all the artworks are a product of that period. 
the actual history, the actual uh, day-to-day uh, series of events that took place have all become uh, myths and legends. You know, the, the myth-making has been so complete. And today, we're literally almost 80 years away from when uh, most of these things took place, uh, particularly uh, 80 years away from when Raza was 21 years old and arrived uh, in, in Bombay at the time in 1943. So um, I'm just going to kind of take you through my journey. A lot of this is my journey of discovery. Um, a lot of it uh, is because I stumbled upon certain um, artworks and objects that kind of uh, made me do a lot of thinking uh, and then put me through a very large um, quest for research. And then eventually that's what uh, turned out to be this book that I'm working on with my co-author Sanjana uh, Srinivasan, who um, currently is in England. Uh, but uh, she and I have been uh, going through a lot of this. Uh, Sanjana represents a completely uh, fresh view on Indian modern art. And, and I come in and, and we kind of have been having a lot of fun working on this because, uh, you know, uh, she brings in a lot of the theory. I bring in a lot of the, the journey and the ideas and, and, and the, the direction in which we did our research. So uh, I just share my screen uh, with all of you very quickly. Uh, do give me one second. So, um, yeah, so this is um, Raza. Um, this this was a picture actually recently acquired by um, the Piramal Museum of Art, and it's a portrait of Raza um, painted by Langhammer. And I'll talk about Langhammer uh, in, in just a little bit so that, uh, you know, it gives better context to who he is. But yeah, this is uh, Raza possibly when he was probably 25, 26, um, much before he goes to uh, Paris or in France. So this is while he is in Bombay. So um, this is actually where my journey started. What you're seeing on the right side, which is a, a sheet of a calendar, and it's dated August 1948. So um, I'm a, a, a frequent visitor of uh, uh, marketplaces, antique shops, Radhiwalas, and so on. So. Um, one of those days, this guy, he brought this calendar to me and he's like, sir, I have calendars. I said, sure, give me, show me, whatever. And then I looked at this and this actually completely took me aback. I was not expecting to ever stumble upon a calendar uh, which had Raza's uh, artwork in it. I, I've actually, I mean, the, the kind of work looked familiar. I've seen one or two watercolors before. And I was like, okay, but this calendar actually had all 12 months um, that were painted and illustrated by Raza. And I've never seen something like this. And um, the, there were a lot of uh, interesting things there. The fact that this was a full calendar commissioned um, by or for Raza. And uh, it's very unusual to find, even in the 40s, entire calendars uh, dedicated to one artist. You know, it's like having monographs published today. It's a big thing if an artist has a, a book, an entire book for themselves. So this is like a whole calendar, but you know, it looked very uh, uh, commercial in that sense that it was. Uh, you know, marketplaces across uh, a lot of uh, uh, central and, and northern India where, you know, it was showing a lot of, uh, you know, trade in commodities. So then, of course, luckily, this calendar had the cover page and the cover page uh, clearly was a calendar for a company called Volkart. Now, Volkart Brothers um, has a very long history um, in, in, in Mumbai, and they've been around uh, from the 1850s, you know, and eventually became, I think, the world's largest cotton grower. And uh, Volkart finally in the 40s uh, and, and 50s, uh, you know, became Voltas because uh, Tata's uh, bought over Volkart and Tata's bought over uh, Volkart coffee estate. So, so a lot of, um, you know, uh, Volkart kind of blended into what Tata is today. But the point is, uh, and then of course, on the left hand side, you see a painting, which is the original, which again came up uh, very recently uh, for sale in an auction, um, you know, um, like literally a few months ago. And it's the original painting to what you see in the calendar. But at this point, um, I was very confused. I was trying to figure out Volkart. I was trying to, you know, uh, but there's nothing, there's no information. I couldn't get any information whatsoever. Um, you know, uh, Sanjana and I were sitting and searching. We just couldn't connect Volkart with uh, Raza. So we're like, you know, I was looking at it, uh, you know, and then we actually let go of the calendar. And I, I, I you know, uh, it eventually, today the calendar is with the uh, Priya Paul collection in Delhi. 
um but i was just you know uh, very intrigued and let it go after a few months of uh, chasing this uh, calendar to see what it was and um sometime maybe about 6 months later i was you know we we did our exhibition so we did the raza exhibition um, i had you know all the information we we touched upon uh, his early years and um then after the exhibition i happened to be again sitting around uh, a collector's house um uh, you know and looking at some books in their library when i saw this book um it's uh, it's it's called 100 years of indian cotton by uh, dantwala who Uh, we found out um, had a lot to do with the cotton industry uh, of of India, Bombay particularly. Uh, and this story, I, I won't get into a lot of that because you'll read it in the book. Uh, it can be a bit exhaustive, but uh, Bombay and cotton are very closely connected. Um, it was one of the largest, uh, you know, exporters of cotton for a while. Uh, it brings in the legacies of everybody from, uh, you know. Uh, the tatas and the brillas and 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 everybody who is anything uh, in bombay today uh, it it built uh, bombay right it started with the uh, opium trade in the 1850s and evolved into cotton trade and today you know every large industrial uh, family started uh, with their mills uh, in bombay um, either spinning cotton weaving cotton textiles and so on and so forth uh, the legacy of the piramal museum itself is is, is from the cotton industry so um but yeah so i saw this book and then i was looking at it and then here it said volkart brothers and i was like wait a minute where did volkart brothers come from again and and the image that you're seeing here actually which says cotton pickers uh, cotton picking in south india uh, that's been done by um, langhammer again so it's not by raza but it's by langhammer but um if you look, the, the the acknowledgments here surprisingly said you know picture number 11 14 22 29 30 with blocks of last four courtesy of volkar brothers and it turned out that three out of these four uh, were raza's works and they were repeated um uh, images which raza had done for volkar brothers so now i was starting to find a bunch of these uh, volkar um images right or rather what raza had painted for volkar um and then i started going back uh, now we were like full fledged researching Uh, on what was happening what are these images so i just started looking at every archive predominantly the auction houses uh, for uh, any of raza's early watercolors and a picture started to emerge actually that um, there was a variety of these um, images there were some that focused specifically on cotton growing there were some that focused on cotton manufacturing and some that focused on cotton all over india and then we realized that we had to trace the history of volkart brothers to understand what raza was painting and when we started research um everything seemed out of place like there's just absolutely uh, no information that we found on this um, so we said okay let's start completely afresh and let's go to all the literature that's been written about raza because there is a lot written about raza and when we started doing that i don't know if this is something uh you know that that was a good thing or a bad thing but eventually it turned out that um the early periods of raza had to be um reviewed and revised so a uh, big simple thing simple facts um like for example <clears throat> his spelling you know like uh Raza today is actually spelt S A Y E D in 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 a lot of the publications and a lot of um uh, places where you will find his name but i said you know let's figure out because it's S Y E D in some places and it's S A Y E D um a lot of historians published um you know with two different spellings so i said okay let's so thanks to the uh, archives at the raza foundation we were able to pull out his school certificates and uh his early 1940s 19 uh, you know late 30s uh, records to see what was his name you know i mean short of uh, i suppose his passport or some kind of an id so um for purposes of my research and the purpose of the book that we're writing we decided we'll stick to sayed because you can see here sorry it's a very blurred uh, picture but this is his um, half yearly report from damo uh, government high school so uh, raza <coughs> studies in a few places Uh, all in central india so um he's he's in damo he's born in mandala it's all uh, foresty areas uh, very rural india his father was a, a forest warden so therefore uh, he lived a fairly um, you know uh, 
not a nomadic life, but traveling between these ranges, uh, pinch that area today, you know, so, um, and would have been fairly remote at the time. So I think for purpose of education, Raza's father decides to keep him, you know, as close to the bigger cities as possible. So, uh, and, and Dhamma was a little bit more uh, accessible uh, school. And you can see what Raza uh, studied, you know, because it's very important to know what Raza is made of, right? Um, if you wanted to write an in-depth uh, story about him. So uh, he does English and Hindi composition, mathematics, chemistry, and he seems like a good student. I mean, I know the marking system was very tough in those days, right? Like uh, today, if you get 100% uh, percent is when you get into college. But uh, in those days, I know my parents would always say they got, I used to always say, you know, like <clears throat> to judge my uh uh, performance at school and asked my parents they'd be like no no see we got 60 percent and got into our college but 60 percent was great uh you know in the in, in the 70s so i suppose in the 30s and 40s uh whatever raza has got here which i would say is about um <clears throat> 25 35 40 percent you know which is very good so he was a good student um his attendance is impeccable you will see that he has attended 87 of 87 days and every every school report uh, even even all the way to his college, he has never missed a day of school or college. This is unbelievable. So, you know, it gives us the, we start to now see the flavor of Raza, like what kind of a person was he? Uh, how did he, uh, you know, behave and what, what made his character? You know, so the character is also building and we bring that along <clears throat> throughout this book. So, um, so yeah, so we're looking at all kinds of facts, um, where he was born, what he did, what he studied, uh, you know, because the, the basic story about Raza is he studied in Nagpur and then he comes to Bombay, he studies in JJ school for five years and then he graduates in 47, he starts the Progressive Artist Group and so on and so forth. But uh, all of that is actually very wrong. Um, information now, uh, evidence uh, actually says that a lot of this is uh, very wrong. And hopefully we will, um, you know, correct uh, these uh, understandings. So um, this is to give you an idea uh, of how the education system functioned in the 1940s, 30s, 40s. And this impact is actually there even on Hussein and Souza and everybody. Anybody who was a pre-independent India artist or, or a student, the system was very different. And I'll just take some time to uh, talk about this. And if you look at this, I've, I've reproduced... Um, a record from the JJ School uh, of Art. Every year they would actually put out this uh, report on who passed which exam and who studied there and who was given what award and so on and so forth. So this is from 1939, where uh, it shows, if you look at number, somewhere in the middle of the image, number five, it says Syed. Again, here it's S-Y-E-D. Uh, again, more evidence that, uh, you know, he was S-Y-E-D. And, um, it shows that he's from the Nagpur School of Art, Nagpur. And then you can see multiple other institutions. You even have Model Art Institute, Dadar. You have Institute of Fine Arts, Bombay. You have the Ketkar Art Institute, Bombay. So we are like, okay, how many art in Nutan Kala Mandir, Bombay? You know, so we're like, how many art schools did exist? Because we only hear of JJ School or if at best, Indore and Nagpur and, you know, the, the larger institutions. So we started to look at the structure. So, so we get into... Um, how were these courses structured? How did artists have to study? What did they have to study? So we've now begun to understand that uh, the system is not a three-year or a five-year course the way we think of college. It was not just post-grad, uh, undergrad, and so on and so forth. So um, there were there were many sections. Like here, if you see, Raza has been uh, given a, a pass for elementary examination in drawing and painting. So they had grades, they had elementary, they had professional, they had, you know, and then they had even a category which you had to pass to be a teacher. You could go and teach art or you could qualify with that degree to teach in any school, which is what Raza does. And and, and he does go teach part time uh, at a couple of schools around the area, because I suppose uh, from day one, he has had a, a, a very large necessity to uh, keep himself financially um, independent, you know, because he does come from a large family of not so great means. Definitely his father was able to educate him. But uh, yeah, I'm sure there were a, a lot more demands, um, you know, financially. And it's something that we'll see uh, throughout his early years that there is a lot of uh, financial pressure on him. And he himself says so many, many times. So, um, yeah, so to understand that the education system was very different, 
and artists could study for a very long period of time. And it also looked like artists could uh, study, take a break. So you just had to complete the levels. It didn't matter whether you completed them in a year or two or completed them after a gap of two, three years. You know, So um, with that, we start to realize that uh, Raza actually didn't study at the JJ school when he came to Bombay. He comes in 1943 to Bombay. Uh, the very important fact, and I'm sorry, I missed this out earlier, is that part of this education system meant that your final examinations would have to have been taken at the JJ school. So Raza does not come to Bombay for the first time in 1943, as most publications make it out to be. Raza actually would have come 1938, 39, 40, 41, uh, whenever he was at uh, Nagpur school to come to Bombay to write his final exam. And um, there are many, many uh, recorded instances uh, of this. Even Hussein did the same thing. Uh, uh, Bendre did the same thing. The, anybody who studied Indore, anybody who studied at Nagpur uh, had to come. Gade would have also had to come to Bombay. So the familiarity with Bombay certainly existed. It was not uh, something new to him, which is why when he comes to Bombay, we start to see him rapidly do things. Like it's as if he hit the ground uh, running at a super fast speed and was able to achieve a lot of things, right? So, um, so yeah, so then we started doing more research, uh, more dates, like this picture is a very famous picture of uh, Raza and the progressives. And uh, it's funny, like we were looking, we had four books written by a lot of these uh, authors who write about Raza and we were looking at them and we're like, you know, each single book has a different piece of information on the same photo including the source of the photo. If you look at four books, there are four different sources. The photo is sourced to being from Raza, from Hussein, from Gaitonde, and from Gade. So, you know, it's funny that one image has four sources. Secondly, the person, I understand that it's misguiding that, you know, somebody has written on the photo saying progressive artist group assembled at Bombay Art Society in 1947. Now, this is completely wrong. Uh, and, and how we got to this is because we looked at the pictures behind that are on display and they're all by Raza. They're all of Raza's paintings that he does in 1949. Uh, and and um, therefore, we then were like, who is in this picture? Why is Gaitonde there? Because you hear of Gaitonde being part of the progressives in the 1950 exhibition. And then, you know, and, and this picture is cropped, but there's also Tayeb Mehta sitting there in this picture. So it confused everything that we knew, you know, and, and started to question not just Raza's history, but the history of the progressives itself. So which is why in our book, we have uh, gone ahead and written a chapter uh, to rewrite the history of the progressive artist group and how they formed and why they formed and, and to get a fairly accurate count uh, on the number of exhibitions that they actually did. Um, I will talk about it a little later uh, to give you perspective on Souza and Hussein and, and all of them in context of Raza and, and the idea of progressive and the idea of uh, modernism in Indian art. So, um, so, you know, so every fact that we were looking at was seemingly wrong. And, and as you can see here, um, you know, why is Gaitonde here? Why is it dated 1947? Uh, why, they are very clearly paintings uh, of Raza from 1949 at the back. So, you know, so, such things were being uh, looked at. This, of course, um, we finally then found out who one of the major players in, in this uh, myth making was. And I, I uh, please, please forgive me. Uh, and I do not mean to offend anyone, but Raza himself was part of uh, this myth making because there are many interviews in which he says things and I think uh, it is in all fairness to everybody who has uh, interviewed him, worked with him and, and treated him as the primary source obviously had to go with what he said. It's, you know, the, the source is telling you his history and you have to listen to it. But um, uh, I don't know, fortunately, unfortunately for Raza himself, he's done so much in the 40s that you can actually uh, pick up and say, hey, you know, uh, he may have said this, but here's this evidence that's uh, either contrary or in support of uh, what he says. So, um, you know, a big part of uh, Raza, which nobody talks about, which we want to bring back uh, in because it's, it's very relevant. And I think uh, with all respect again to Raza and his personal um, uh, uh, you know, uh, choices and his feelings, you know. So uh, this picture you're seeing here is Raza leaning against the window in his studio, which would have been Raja Ram uh, studio. Um, um, and it's obviously there's a calendar, again, another calendar behind him, but that's not important. There's another picture of this gentleman 
um, the smaller thumbnail image, which um, actually is not Raza. Uh, obviously, he looks very much like Raza, but he's not Raza. He is uh, Ali Imam, who is Raza's brother. And uh, this was another big part of Raza's early history that was very important to understand because um, clearly Raza had his very strong opinions, his personal opinions on why he wanted to stay back in India in 1948. Uh, partition must have played a very large role. Uh, everybody except um, uh, Raza uh, left for Pakistan from his family, including um, and, and I'm saying this because I have to also unsay it at some point. Uh, uh, so the, the history books say that Raza's wife, uh, his first wife, also went to Pakistan. But now, uh, thanks to our research, we do have evidence that she was in India till at least 1952, um, at least for a couple of years after uh, Raza had left for Paris. But Ali Iman, um, Imam is, is, is his brother, uh, younger by two years. Uh, Raza was born in 19... On February 2nd, 1922, and Ali Imam was born in 1924. And he goes to Pakistan. And um, the interesting thing is, uh, Raza wasn't the only one who studied Nagpur. Ali Imam also studied art at the Nagpur school. And uh, along with him came to Bombay. Ali Imam was in Bombay. He also studied at JJ School of Art. In fact, he studies at JJ School of Art. Um, in 1942 and 1943, he works part-time and he studies in the evening uh, program. It was not a, a full-day program. It was a part-time uh, program that he was part of. And uh, in 48, he leaves. But uh, Ali Imam was a very big part of the progressive artists of Pakistan and the progressive writers of Pakistan, mirroring what was happening here in India at the time. I mean, 1930s, you had the progressive writers, the theater groups and all of them. So Ali Imam was part of that. And he also was part of the Communist Party um, in, in um, Pakistan, Was then had to uh, leave and go to London for about 10, 15 years, England for 10, 15 years. Uh, and then he came back. And Ali Imam is considered the father of modern art in Pakistan because he set up a gallery called the Indus and, and so on. So there's such a large history um, that, and of course, uh, uh, Raza had a couple of uh, other siblings and, and the elder brother also goes to Pakistan, had a daughter. That daughter is a very famous artist uh, in, in Karachi today. So there's, there's a lot of history about Raza. Um, his personal family, his life that uh, has been said in bits and pieces. If you if you take all the 50 books written on Raza, you might find uh, some of this information, but uh, a lot of it is deliberately left out because I think personally Raza did not want to talk about it. Um, his wife, uh, Fatima, her name is Fatima, uh, is in every book, uh, there's only one photo of her that we have found, and it's a picture of Raza sitting next to her and Mrs. Langhammer and Mrs. Rudy von Leiden. Uh, and, and the picture says, uh, you know, mentions all their names and lady. So I, I don't know why at some point of time she became and lady. But um, Fatima is there and Fatima, um, you know, uh, was very young when they met. They were, I think, cousins. They got married. Um, and then she came with Raza to Bombay. Um, Raza didn't live uh, in Bombay. Again, the stories say how he came there. He was living in an apartment and a taxi driver. And there was, a, you know, all this stuff. And then how he used to stay at uh, Express Block Studio. And, you know, that's that's the legend. But um, Raza, actually, uh, his father, I believe, uh, was also stationed in Kalyan or had a house in Kalyan, uh, which at those days would have been as far away uh, Chennai was probably as far as Kalyan is to Bombay today. So, um, but Raza used to live there, and he would travel uh, down to um, uh, Fort, uh, where most of the offices were, where Raza worked, and and his wife stayed there. Eventually, after Raza's father passed away, uh, his mother moved in with him in Kalyan. So, um, and 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 we have found letters where Raza has written to other friends of his, where he says, you know, like. Uh, he's been trying to take care of his wife and, and a very uh, very funny but very sad incident where Raza talks about taking Fatima to the hospital because she had a stomach problem and then on the way back in the train the train window closed on her hand so she had to go back to the hospital and uh, so you know there was Raza talking about his life and this was in 1949 sometime so uh, yeah so these kind of stories we've been researching we've been trying to talk about it um, there's no particular, uh, uh, you know, uh, effort to discredit anybody. But we want to talk about this. And I think this is what makes Raza a lot more uh, 
powerful as an artist and i'm starting to fall in love with this man right like i'm seeing this guy there is nobody as dedicated as he is sitting in bombay at this point uh trying to be an artist so i have a rough image you know by this point about who raza is and what he is and what's motivating him so i then said okay now we have this how did he arrive at these watercolors we're seeing how did he arrive at the calendars uh, you know that we have seen and um, you know what are, how do i make sense of his artwork now like what is raza what kind of a painter was he uh, how did he arrive at modernism and then of course the big question how did he become part of the progressives uh, what was their agenda and 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 so on because again uh, the progressives we heavily know that it was you know um, founded uh, by souza and it was spearheaded by him and he was the vocal person behind this group uh, but i wanted to know like you know what was uh going on at that time that that drove raza to at least uh figure out what modernism was for himself right so uh and then of course the last part of the quest was uh did he study in jj school he didn't but uh raza did study only for one year at jj school which was 1947 to 19 like 1947 to 1948 and the luckily for us the jj school has a wonderful archive of his examination artworks they have six works uh, which are all dated 1947 this particular one uh, sh raza uh, signed indian summer and if you notice it's figurative it's unlike many of his work when people talk about it they immediately swing to amrita shergill uh, who raza might have also said he is a fan of and inspired by because you know in the 70s 80s 90s when you're an artist talking about modern art if you don't acknowledge you know amrita shergill it doesn't put you in context so uh, however this uh, what he has done was actually uh, curriculum work um, this was required because if you were an indian student both by birth and by culture um, you would be put in the indian department uh, of the the painting school uh, at jj school they had many departments each one functioned as its own uh, atelier as its own uh, group of students and this is where in 47 um, raza would have been classmates with tayeb and gaitonde and and prabha and and uh, banu athaya and all these people uh, who you know eventually go on to be part of the progressives so um Yeah so this is to give you an idea of what was happening then so you see raza uh, academically painting for college and then you see all the others so the the one on the right the larger image that's gaiton day painted in 1949 again as part of something he had to do for his examinations uh, the center picture is b prabha and the first picture is banu athiya so um you know you start to suddenly realize that okay everybody is painting similar works and the reason was because they were all students of ahivasi and ahivasi of course uh, was a very influential teacher he was the first principal uh, of the painting department they had multiple principals and they had superintendents and they had uh, you know the the, the uh, administrator and the governor of the college but um ahivasi was running the painting de department the indian painting school and he made sure that his idea which was a hybrid between ajanta elora and miniature paintings uh, and nationalism heavy nationalism uh, were all brought in and and so all these artists started here you know so this is the idea they had uh, of course raza did it only because he was part of that class because literally the picture i've shown you uh, the previous one is one of two examples that exist of that style the remaining pictures that raza had done for his examinations were identical to the watercolors that he was doing of bombay and for the volkart commissions and so on so clearly raza had attended college but he continued to do what he did because when by 1947 raza is a legend like raza is a rock star in the bombay art scene he's the uh, you know young kid he's the go getter uh, and he's already by 19 i mean think about it 1947 he's in college but from 1944 onwards he's been winning gold and silver medals at the bombay art society so we'll i'll talk about that uh, in in a little bit as well so um so started to explore the whole time i said okay I, there's no point in looking at just raza in isolation we were like you know how do we look at bombay as a whole and we went way back our book actually starts way back in the 1850s and talks about how wealth was created in bombay how art came into bombay uh, how there were you know eastern influences western influences what shaped the city 
And we then arrive at the 1930s and 40s when two things were happening. In the late 1930s, you had a lot of returning uh, highly educated Indians, right? They were, they were the Indians who were wealthy and went to uh, Europe to study. And, and they became, you know, everybody from Mulk Anand to all your progressive writers, progressive theater group people, actors, and whoever. Uh, and, and then you had, uh, and filmmakers, all of them. And then you had uh, the second set who were the uh, people who were coming into India as they were fleeing Europe, uh, predominantly from uh, the Nazi regime. So the late 30s uh, and very early 40s saw a lot of people coming in uh, into Bombay and making it this like hotbed of uh, modernist ideas, right? And the word progressive was thrown around quite a bit because um, I mean, the idea of word progressive has existed uh, in art uh, for a while, but um, in Bombay particularly, they started using the word progressive rather than modern. And here I put a, I, by the way, the, this book research, I have probably read more newspapers uh, for this book than I ever have cumulatively in all my life. So um, so we found a lot of newspaper clippings thanks to uh, archives that exist in Bombay. The Asiatic Society Archives is phenomenal. Uh, the, the Maharashtra State Archives is amazing. Uh, everything is available there uh, if you have the time and energy. So if you can see here, there's a small yellow part highlighted which shows R. von Leiden, which is Rudy Rudolf von Leiden, and it has Karl Kandalwala. Uh, key figures in Bombay's art and culture scene. And this paper is from 1941, where they're already trying to put together. And if you read it, it actually says, um, uh, Hindustan Hamara is a 100% Indian production with all that is um, finest in artistic traditions in keeping with the demands of modern international taste. It is modern India. So this sets the tone for Bombay and what's happening. There is this huge quest for trying to be international and trying to be modern, right? And it starts, uh, and, and these two people eventually become key players uh, in, in whether it's art or theater or, or film or whatever it may be. So we realize that there's this bigger movement towards the progressive and Raza was part of that, right? So when Raza lands up uh, in Bombay, uh, and, and you can read the book because I can't tell you the whole book. Nobody would then buy it. But um, the, the point is Raza comes to Bombay because of his prior connections to the city and finds a job at a commercial studio. And he comes in up to, we know he lands up in September. And by November, he submits his, his works for uh, the Bombay Fine Arts Society Salon. Now, Bombay Fine Arts Society uh, exhibitions were the uh, Bombay Art Society, sorry, not Fine Arts, Bombay Art Society, those exhibitions were the ultimate annual uh, art event. That's when awards were given, recognitions were made. If you're an award-winning artist, you were set for the next one year, uh, purely because people would collect you, people would want to commission you, so on and so forth. And it always happened in the, the exhibition would take place in January and submissions were in December. So, so we know that 1943, December, Raza submitted some artworks. And that is when Rudy von Leiden finds Raza. He sees Raza and... Um, uh, talks quite highly of him. In fact, in th this is just a report from the newspaper which says no gold medals awarded. Uh, the society's gold medal was not been awarded this year. The silver medal for oil painting went to Mali uh, and uh, Mr. S.H. Raza got the silver medal for his watercolor surface Osha Mehta Road. Now, uh, this is very important because the, the reason why they don't give gold medals is because they felt that the standard was not met. So, but giving a silver medal to Raza, the first time he uh, sends a work, spoke very highly. And Rudy's um, essay about this particular exhibition also talks about how he saw everything in one corner. He noticed Raza's works and they were the best works he had seen at the exhibition that year. And that's the first connection Raza makes to a mentor role, somebody who was going to um, help him through his career, uh, understand what the pursuit of modernism is and expose him to international ideas, right? So um, this is the first connection. And and off the right off the bat, Raza has got himself a Bombay Art Society Award. And you can see that here, uh, Ara also got the Governor's Prize. So Ara uh, and, and Raza are actually meeting uh, possibly here. And, and 
Ara is the uh, a prodigy of uh, Rudy and Langhammer from the late 30s. So the groups are starting to form. The ideas are starting to take place now, right? So this, by the way, all of you, uh, most of you probably are seeing for the first time. This is the painting Ferosa Mehta Road, um, which Raza won the silver medal for. It's something that I myself have only recently found. Uh, and this is why my book keeps getting delayed. Uh, now there are no more delays, it will be done. Uh, but the important thing here to notice is that uh, it is um, signed in Hindi. It's our Nagari script. It's, it's signed Raza and he has the year. And I had only once before seen something uh, like that signed in. So I realized that this was the kind of work, the quality of work, the structure, construction, composition of work that Raza had already been doing in Nagpur. Now, you will understand if all of you go back and look at the school and student work of Souza or Hussein or, or anybody and look at what Raza was doing, now you understand why Rudy was kind of you know, impressed by what he did. The second picture, now this is a, a picture which hangs at the Nagpur Museum now. It would have been part of Raza's Nagpur school submission. This is also signed Raza in Hindi with a date. Uh, and you can see the strength in composition. You can see the play of light. You can see the almost photographic capturing of light, the, the, the vantage point where he's standing on top of a building. Now go look at every Raza painting of this period. You'll realize that there is always a vantage. There is nothing at street level. It's always painted from a, almost a photographic uh, vantage point. It's, it's part of the trade at that time. It's part of what people were doing at that time. Uh, and, and this is what Raza comes into Bombay painting. He's already fairly uh, phenomenal. He's very, um, you know, uh, talented, very clearly talented. Um, and, and unfortunately, we're not able to find anything on his Nagpur days about the teachers. Uh, even if we have the names of the teachers, we're not able to track down what they did or what they painted uh, to be able to understand. But the chances are that Raza uh, was influenced a lot from the Indore school as well, because Indore, Nagpur uh, were all, you know, uh, one little group and, and they would all meet at Bombay. People like Bendre, people, you know, would have influenced these guys. Uh, Bendre would have been like... Uh, maybe 10 years older, but, you know, he definitely would have influenced um, uh, what Raza was doing because Bendre by this time, by the 40s, also starts to become prominent at the Bombay Art Society. Um, so, so all those old connections between teachers and students would have been made, influences would have been there. Um, but Raza starts to, you know, he, he, you, you can see the quality of his work. And then, uh, of course, through Rudy, he ends up meeting what I call the three Europeans, but what um, the history of the progressives has um, given these three people incredible positions and incredible uh, credit to what they have done. Um, I do kind of um, uh, bring them back down to earth in the book and I talk about each person's role. Like if you look at Langhammer, he is a fantastic painter, no doubt. And, and you'll hear, uh, you know, him being... Um, uh, compared to Oskar uh, Kakoshka, who's an Austrian painter. And, and then they say that influence comes down, which is German expressionism. And then that's what influences Raza and most people uh, in Bombay. But that's not true because Raza's already come in with some kind of a, uh, a idea that is, uh, you know, uh, uh, expressionism in its uh, core. And then he tries to adapt it for Indian uh, palettes. But um, so I talk about Rudy, we talk about Langhammer, uh, we talk about Schlesinger. Schlesinger, again, was a patron. You know, he, he spent a lot of money uh, supporting these artists, the progressives. Um, possibly, uh, you know, these three guys were written about a lot more because they were more vocal, they were um, white, and they, they, they were... Um, people who are well connected in good positions. And if you were part of the Indian art market and the Indian art uh, scene and ecosystem at that time, uh, you would want to be uh, on the good side of these guys because they could do things for you. Because Rudy was, and now this is where things start to make sense, Rudy was several things amongst, uh, you know, what he did anyway in general in the art world. He was uh, the head of PR for the Warcard Brothers. And Langhammer was the head designer for Times of India. 
and they worked with each other very frequently and that's how they started mentoring these young artists and these young artists would come to them because these guys were the only access to europe they were the only access to uh, ideas of international art and international modernism and i think eventually the, the whole uh, ecosystem in bombay you know kind of uh, over time started to see them as being important it was kind of a uh, 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 some kind of an association that gave context but i talk about it i try to um you know uh, kind of give it a very level playing field for what these guys did but yeah so so while their influences are very strong i think raza um was more not influenced by any of them but rather was supported a lot by them so which is why when we come back to the volkart calendar we start to find out the story like so so the volkart brothers um, you know they're a very large manufacturing company across uh, india agriculture commodities so on and so forth so we realize that this calendar is from 1948 but it must have been published and designed by 1947 because you know you need it uh, a year before uh, it gets uh, you know put out and then we found out that uh, raza had actually done a calendar in 1940 Six, forty-five, forty-six, and forty-seven, which came out in forty-six, forty-seven, and forty-eight, and that's how we started finding so many themes. As I said earlier, there were three themes that we found, and this gave us a reason. But again, why calendars? And then we found out that Rudy is actually uh, part of another organization, right? So, which I'll I'll talk about a little later. And that organization actually promoted commercial art. that organization promoted uh, the fact that commercial art is also art and it should be recognized as such so but anyway so so coming to the actual volkart uh, commission itself um this is a, again a detail of a painting you can see here that it's actually some kind of uh, you know sorting that's going on uh, there are women uh, picking through things there are men at the back very you know you can see the uh, raza's very prominent style here his sense of color uh you possibly maybe his figuration comes from you know what he learned at uh, jj school a little bit but um he he definitely was good at um figurative he just decided not to do it for the rest of his life um but here this was our breakthrough so we found out again how bombay is connected there's something uh you know there, there was a something called the hamilton studios uh, in 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 uh, ballad estate which is right next to where pandols is today and um that photography studio was commissioned by volkart brothers to go all over india take pictures of all the volkart production centers and uh, raza was obviously given these photos and made these paintings from that which again solved a huge mystery because in in the history books it says raza traveled quite a bit in fact suza himself goes and quotes about how raza is so well traveled and he's gone all over india painting and things like that and we start to realize that raza didn't go anywhere he went from his house to his to you know his office where uh, he he did these pictures uh, paintings compositions based out of photographs um the book covers a whole bunch of them um, there are paintings you will see that are identical to photographs here you can see the ladies you know the way they're sitting down and what they're doing and how uh, it could have given inspiration to the previous picture like how uh, this is the same thing so so these these are from uh, the photographs commissioned by volkart as well uh, so and i i suppose volkart felt it would be better to have a calendar of paintings rather than to have a calendar of photographs like this so um this is again um so coming to why raza um wanted to uh, do this and why rudy supported him is because rudy was the chairman of something called the indian institute of art and industry and uh, as you can see uh rudy found the perfect uh, artist you know who who was able to handle commercial who was able to bring in all the elements of what modern art was perceived to be at that time um so yes so 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 rudy was uh, giving raza an opportunity to do these calendars and then uh, in calcutta that's where the uh, indian institute of art and industry was actually headed there was a chapter which rudy was chairman of in bombay um was funded by dunlop and dunlop would give awards to artists who were painting calendars so it it's a phenomenal uh, chain of events that you know uh supported raza people wanted to support him uh this is how he was also financially stable he was you know while he didn't actually have to be a student full time 
uh, and was also able to explore things. So this happens all the way till 1947. So, uh, you know, he, he's he's doing commercial work, he's doing all of this. And 47 is when he officially graduates from JJ school. And, uh, and that's studying only for one year, but he graduates. And now he says, I have to be a, a modern artist. And, and by this time, he starts to meet uh, Sousa and Ara and him are already discussing ideas of progressive. Um, the book talks about it in a lot of detail, and I'm not going to get into it, but I will try, and I'm also uh, severely running out of time. So I will try and uh, get into this quickly. So, but the question came about in the book, uh, and we were, we talk about whether Raza was a commercial artist or a fine artist. And this is a very interesting line to think of, you know, because it, it possibly is also the reason why Raza went to Paris and started all over again. He went to college, he went, you know, learned how to paint. He, he wanted to study what European art was. And possibly he felt that, you know, he wanted to move away. Also uh, to point that um, all these works, uh, Raza himself was never happy with these early watercolors. You know, he would talk about it um, saying, you know, he did it or it had to be done kind of thing. And he never uh, brought them, um, you know, as part of his primary, uh, you know, body of works. But his entire, um, you know, whatever makes Raza is actually hidden in all these works, these early works. You know, there is so much story and there is so much character to them. Um, and, and you learn about Raza that you realize that the, the foundation or the, or the blueprint for Raza is actually in this period. And then he executes it uh, over, over the next 60 years after that. So Kashmir um, is, a, is a major part of, of, of Raza's early life. And this is the first time that he decides to be a modern artist and goes off on his own. And this is entirely in, in, in connection with um, his pursuit of uh, being in the progressives. And it's actually a, a, a journey that he takes parallel to the progressive artist group because they are not involved in this. And Raza's Kashmir trip, Kashmir series of works, Kashmir exhibitions, and uh, you know, are what actually get him uh, all the recognition uh, that eventually enables him to go to Paris. Uh, not just about the exhibitions he had, but awards that he was winning. Uh, you know, he continued to win uh, Bombay Art Society awards. He was given quite a bit. He, even in, in, in Calcutta, there was an exhibition in, in 1949 where he won 2,500 rupees. It was crazy. Um, there was a lot of money then. I believe that's what helped him to also, um, uh, you know, go on that journey out of India. So a lot of these mysteries, hopefully, you know, would be answered. Um, and, and this is the kind of work we did. But uh, I hope all of you have had a slightly better understanding uh, of, of Raza now um, and, and uh, would look at um, what he did and, and what actually makes him. Hopefully, uh, you know, by Feb uh, for Raza's 100th year, the book should be out. And, and with all the support of uh, the Raza Foundation, uh, it should be out. But Thank you all uh, for listening to me. I, I've been rambling on for a bit over 50 minutes. So, uh, yeah. So, thank you so much. I'm going to just quickly stop sharing the screen so I can see Mr. Vajpayee, whether uh, he is in total shock or he is grinning. No. Uh, what, you, what, what you have given us is a very interesting perspective, something most of us have not known. If there are any comments or questions, uh, listeners, please free, feel free to ask uh, Mr. Rajgopalan if you have any questions. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely happy to answer any. And um, or people can catch me. I'm on Instagram or, or, or whatever. And people can. It's the digital age. So you, you can catch me whenever. And, and ask questions. Sorry, oh, I missed out. There's an, there's an entire comment section which I missed out on. Sorry, I'm just looking at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, so if anybody has any questions, otherwise, I suppose we can catch people later. Well, Super. perhaps the questions are not there, although I'm quite sure 
that many people who would have watched would have been surprised to know many facts that you have pointed out. And it gives a different picture of Raza's earlier life and art. It is always interesting to find out not only the artistic facts about a major painter, but also about the human reality mm -hmm. in which he or she might have been uh, involved and complicit. And it is interesting that what you have given, um, how he was adept at figurative painting, uh, how he was adept at landscape making, how he was open to many new ideas, uh, and how rooted he was in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, a degree of self-confidence that he showed right from the beginning. Uh, so he does not ar arrive in Mumbai uh, as as a as a novice, but as somebody who has already uh, got the uh, shall we say the, the confidence of imagination and creativity, uh, and that makes him come into the metropolis and find a way and a place for himself. Uh, uh, so. Uh, this itself is a is an interesting uh, aspect that has not been talked about mm -hmm. uh, or even noticed all that much. No, yep. no I, I agree. I completely agree with you, sir. In fact, uh, throughout this whole process, what I have learned is, you know, and I hope that that's what uh, the book will uh, present, is that this is the absolute perfect example of an artist you know the hunger the passion his you know and eventually you realize the generosity like raza i i i've read about enough artists i have you know uh, met enough of them i have uh, looked uh, you know at enough art history but the generosity that this man brings you know you realize it happens because of what he went through when he started off, you know, and, and even here, like in his letters, in his many letters, in his many correspondences, you realize that he was a person who had his own pursuit. He had to, you know, uh, uh, go after his artistic pursuit, but he supported everybody. And in, in fact, in the book on in the chapter on the progressives, I write that it is actually Raza who supports Souza to form the progressives group. You know, he, he says, OK, Souza, you want to be the leader, you can be the leader. You know, you can be the guy who is the voice. Uh, but all the connections, all the contacts come from Raza. Uh, Raza was the poster boy of the progressives. You know, he was the young kid to uh, everybody from um, I mean, Mulkra Janandnal, you should, I mean, the, the affection that they have for Raza, you know, they're like, he's like their younger brother. And, and um, I mean, uh, Kwaja Ahmed Abbas, who, who, who you know, is the film uh, maker, um, he talks about Raza so fondly and, and he, uh, you know, was the guy who actually gets Raza uh, in Kashmir and, and Raza is part of, uh, you know, Sheikh Abdullah's whole movement in Kashmir. Like yes. you, you don't just randomly call a young kid to come to Kashmir and uh, you know rejuvenate their art and culture, but clearly uh, you know uh, the, the the prime minister of Kashmir knew that Raza had what it took to come and you know vitalize the artwork, uh, the, the art world there. And then of course he starts the progressive artists of Kashmir. There's so much you know the, one did, didn't realize that in, in in seven years he would do like you know so much and 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 you know. It should take a few days to talk about. So. Yes, I have I have run into many artists from Kashmir mm -hmm. who fondly remember the fact mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that it was after the visit of Raza mm -hmm. that something like modern art started emerging yep. in Kashmir, yep. a state which was uh, until then was uh, you know deeply rooted in convention and custom. Right. And, 
what you have. Correct. So it's 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 uh, amazing that uh, yeah. it was he who. Well, somebody mm -hmm. says that uh, Amira Menendez. Look forward to reading the book. As you mentioned, there are a number of facts from that period that need to be revisited. Yes, of course. Absolutely. So with that, I think we come to the end of this afternoon's lecture. Thank you very much, Ashwin Rajgopalan. Thank you so and much, we are, sir. We are very keen uh, and eager that your book comes out. And that no, we, come able, up. We, we will be should be able to arrange a, a, a larger discussion uh, provoked by the book as and when uh, it comes out. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody who has listened to this. It will also be available on YouTube. Namaskar. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you.